Okay, so it's another time for uh, a little bit more Rust compiler development stuff. So today I want to try to do some live coding of investigating a particular problem. Um, I've, I've visited this problem in various contexts before, but it's one I keep coming back to because it's so important for me to figure out how to fix this, this bug. Uh, and it's one where we have this issue where the way that we take async functions, the way we compile them, it ends up compiling to some inefficient code in terms of the, the runtime representation ends up being uh, more expensive than it should be. The example here is one where you have an async function that takes an argument that's an eight kilobyte buffer, a kilobyte array of bytes. And the future that you create when you, when you call an, an async function like this test, if you don't call a wait on it, it creates an object called a future. And if you look at the size of that future, which you can do by taking its address and doing mem size of val like this here, this bit of code here that, you know, can, I can see if I can increase the font size to make this clear. If you do this, it ends up being much larger than it should be, 16K instead of 8K. And essentially it's something where it's doubling the size. This argument here ends up being stored twice in the future that's created. And um, and this can repeat, repeat itself if you compose futures using code like this, which may or may not be a common pattern, um, then you end up getting exponential blow up in the size as demonstrated here. So question is, how can we address this? And something I wanted to look into today was to see if we could use a, I wanted to try to make a, a mere optimization that would um, address the problem. So to be clear, um, the, the heart of the issue here is that we've got code that's running um, with an example like, so the one that we just saw is this code here. And if we call Rust on that example, uh, if I go to the correct directory first and then call Rust on that example, uh, and then if I pass in the correct addition for it, then we see the exact behavior that was described in the bug. And the reason this happens is that if you look at the, um, the way that this code is compiled, you can look at the, uh, some unpretty code for it. Um, which I just talked about in other presentations about the Rust compiler, you can see that the code that looks like this async function test ends up turning into um, a little bit more of a complicated thing where it, actually, I'm not gonna show the, show the here. I'm gonna try to decide what to show here. Um, uh, let's, let's see. Because I don't think, if I look at the expanded one, that's not going to show the, the, the way this desugars. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that I've got to show either the, the here or the, the here tree or the here flat. I don't know. I haven't seen the here flat before, actually. Um, I wonder what that looks like. That's not that helpful. Um, well, it might be. No, it's not. Let's, let's try here again. So the point is that this code ends up turning to something where you have uh, this argument being passed in here, and then we create a closure, it's actually a generator that passes in a task context and then captures the argument as an upvar here. So this, these vertical bars right here represent the fact that this thing is actually going to be a generator. We're using the closure syntax in the here expansion to represent that. Um, so that's what this vertical bar here, and then this, this variable and this um, lang item saying that it's going to be a resume type. Um, uh, I'm surprised that we don't actually see some sort of type representing the context there, but that's what it is. It's the context that gets passed into a future. We have the binding of the up variable to the local arg. And then we have some other code that happens down below. And the crucial point in terms of the, the doubling that I'm talking about is um, the argument gets captured here by this use within the closure. And then it's 
down to a local here, and the generator representation ends up storing the up bars in one spot and the locals in a totally different spot. Now, I've looked at the code that does the layout and I've spent some time trying to puzzle through it and figuring out whether there's something to do with, with the layout code. But a more recent realization that I had with some colleagues is that another way to approach this entirely would be to look at the, um, the, the instead of worrying about the layout code and trying to figure out how to muck with it somehow to, to force this local to be coalesced with this up far when the local and up far are explicit things, Instead, maybe another approach is to just do an analysis of the mirror that transforms it before we get to the point of doing the generator transform that turns the locals into structured data fields on the generator. Before we do that, we could do an analysis of the mirror that looks for occurrences of the local, the copy from the up, of the up bar into the local, and tries to figure out, hey, can we just plug in the up bar in all those spots instead and replace all occurrences of that local with the up bar? getting rid of the local entirely, and thus the generator transform, in theory, um, won't even store the local at all because it won't exist anymore. That's the theory. So how can we figure this out? Well, uh, the first step I'd say is to look at the mirror that's generated for this code and see if we can make sense of it. So um, the particular function that we're looking at, actually, let me make sure there's not already a mirror dump in here. Do that again. Okay, um, so we're looking at this example, ex1a, and we're looking at test. And there's gonna be a bunch of different tests created. In particular, we're gonna have, because there, there's gonna be both lots of uh, transformations on test, but also test itself gets turned into, if you recall when I was showing that, that expansion earlier, test itself has this, these closures, this closure or generator code that gets created as part of it. And so the mirror is going to represent that as something that's part of test. So if we skim down all the mirror that's generated here, you see, in fact, there's all this stuff associated with test itself, right? All these files are for test, the outer test, which corresponds to essentially, if you look at this code here where test is called, you could think of, it, you, you call into test and it's going to create this closure. And then after it's done creating the closure, it, it doesn't do anything else. It just returns it. And so test itself is trivial. It's the closure code that it creates that's non-trivial. And yet in the mirror that's generated, we're probably going to see a bunch of stuff, a bunch of files representing that, that trivial mirror that gets created. In particular, if I just open up this file and look at it, I mean, you, you, we could debate about what trivial means, but um, this ends up being pretty simple because it's got the, the call into here where it passes in the byte array, and then it creates the generator here. And what happens to that argument? Well, it's, it's, it's corresponds to underscore one. And so underscore one is captured here as an up bar in the generator state. And then here we call identity future, um, some function called identity future, and pass in the generator, right? And that will either go to basic block one or basic block two, depending on whether that's successful or not. And then basic block one just says return, basic block two says, um, says panic, resume. So that's, this is a really, truly trivial file, like in terms of what mirror typically looks like. So you, it's hard to get simpler than that in terms of mirror. So the reason for that is because, um, again, the code that we just looked at corresponds to just this call. Like it's one of these things where you have to ignore, you have to sort of treat this whole block of code as something that can be deleted or ignored. It's, it's, it's all part of the closure and not part of the code for test itself. So this is the kind of code that we were just looking at a moment ago. And it's this stuff down here that we want to actually think about doing our analysis on. So, okay, where is that stuff? It's down here under X1A test, um, keep going, closure, this kind of thing. So I think this code, if we even just look at the file sizes, like there are an order of mag there's an order of magnitude difference between the kind of file sizes you see for the things that aren't the closure and the things that are the closure, right? You can see that the file sizes are just 
massively different. And if we look at this then, the generator is something where it's got the up var is captured here, and we should notice that it's represented as um, the self argument for the closure it holds all the up vars and other generator states. It, that, that particular up var is underscore one dot zero. It's a projection of that particular field off of underscore one. And that is the up var that we're interested in. And if we look then at where underscore one dot zero is used, it's copied into underscore three right here. So this is the local that we're concerned about that gets um, copied into. And then underscore three is as a fake read here and then is copied into the underscore 23. Underscore 23 is moved here into this drop call. And that's when we're done using the thing. So if we can replace, if we can do copy propagation all the way through that, and basically everywhere where we see underscore three, um, replace it with underscore one dot zero. And likewise, for underscore 23, replace that with dot underscore one dot zero recursively. We will have the issue here where this is gonna call drop on that up far itself. That like, I, and I don't know off the top of my head whether it's valid to call to pass underscore one dot zero here as an argument to this move expression. It might be that locals have to be um, passed in there. So it might be the case that and that might be fine, actually. It actually probably is perfectly fine to have underscore one dot zero to focus solely on the replacement of it um, just of underscore three and not worry about underscore 23 because the reason that this underscore three becomes part of the generator state is because it lives across a, an await call. There's an await call somewhere in here um, that turns into this code that does other stuff um, involving pinning and whatnot. Uh, the, 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 this part where we create a pin stuff and then we get the extract the context, all this kind of stuff that the generator transformation is basically kind of, um, oh, then this poll call here, for example. All these things though, they basically correspond to, um, the fact that this the local for arg, remember the arg here is both an up var and then there's also a, a local corresponds to it. That local that corresponds to arg lives across this dot await. And that is the thing that we have to address somehow. And the plan is to say, well, let's have the up var live across the dot await instead of the local. And that way we already have the state, state the storage set aside for the up var. Um, we can, we already paid for that. And if we don't, if we can just avoid having a local live across that thing, we won't have to allocate space for it in the generator, separate space for it in the generator. So that's the, the heart of the idea is some analysis that can recursively go through and look at the code, the mirror, identify the places where, um, underscore three, where there's a move from an up var like this into underscore three and then identify all those places importantly though we have to also make sure that there's no other uses of underscore one dot zero we don't want any place that writes to it um or borrows it to be um to 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 be occur in between the places where we're talking about because it's really important that we don't have a situation where you see a, anybody, we don't want to be able to observe the aliasing that we're causing to happen by coalescing these two things. Um, we're, we're inherently going to introduce aliasing where the current code does not have these things aliased. This code is currently having the beat separate locations and it's very important to not be able to observe this transformation that we're talking about. As soon as you have a write into underscore one dot zero um, or underscore one in general, or if you have a borrow of underscore one dot zero, that could turn into something that could, um, again, observe this aliasing, then, then we can't do the transformation anymore. Okay, so that's that's the heart of like what I would like to explore here. And um, I'm gonna pause there.
because I'd like to get this out to show to somebody, and then and then I will uh, start looking at the actual code for doing the transformation itself. So now that we know the sort of problem we want to attack, and we know um, the we have an idea of what the mirror looks like, at least in terms of the way it's printed in the mirror dump. The next question is, okay, well, how can we make this transformation happen? And there's two steps to any kind of transformation like this. One is the analysis that uh, confirms that the transformation is, you, 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 you first analyze the code um, to identify what the transformation looked like and confirm that it's valid. And then you also trans, and then you have something that transforms the code itself. And you could separate these into two separate pieces. Um, in particular, I'm, some, I'm sort of interested to separate them because I would like to, um, I think the hard part of this is likely to be the analysis itself confirming that it's safe to do the transformation because of the details that I mentioned earlier about how you want to make sure that there isn't any place that you could observe the aliasing that we're introducing by coalescing the local with the upvar. But if we assumed that we had an analysis that was correct. The thing I want to check is that the transformation in question actually solves the problem at hand. I would like to actually confirm that if we just force the transformation through and did it, would it actually address this problem we have where the um, arguments are duplicated? So my current plan is to try to actually implement a simple-minded mirror transformation that is going to forcibly do this transformation that I'm describing here. Um, and we will... Uh, my, my hope is I'm going to just do it by um, using a dash Z flag to force the transformation to happen in the first place. And then once I have the transformation in place, then I can use it to confirm that it fixes the problem. And then once I've done that, if I can get that confirmation, that hint that this is good enough, then I can go back and say, okay, let's figure out how to get the analysis right. All right. So the next question is to say, well, how do we actually implement uh, a transformation like this. What, what's involved? It's a great um, first question to sort of, you know approach this with. Um, and as part of this, I was doing a build ahead of time just to make sure I sort of had all the pieces that I need to even get started with this problem. Um, so let's see. Uh, all the mirror transforms live inside of a crate called Rusty Mirror Transform. At least that's a, a vast. There's a, there's a bunch of transformations in here. And for example, the generator transformation that actually takes mirror, this, this is actually one of the largest things in here. Um, how do I, <laughs> I've forgotten how to get this to, um, how to get the dear, the dearity to sort, to sort list by sorting. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, generator is the largest transformation in here because it does a lot of effort to like analyze the code and then do a pretty big transformation of the mirror in that it's replacing certain local. At first it's identified the locals that live across the weight points and then transform those locals into uh, fields of the generator itself. So it's, it's, it's sizable. Um, we're not going to be doing something that complicated. Hopefully the thing we want to do is to uh, do something like constant propagation um, or copy propagation is probably what I would call this where we want to um, identify that these there's things that are, there's these moves from, if you remember the, the, the code I was showing a moment ago um, in um, EX1A test closure, right? We're, we're looking for occurrences of a pattern that looks like local dot blah equals local. And I'm hoping slash guessing that we might get away with a pretty silly analysis that only focuses on that case. You could imagine more elaborate forms of such analysis that you know handle multiple projections or handle recursively, like oh, what if happens if that local is copied to another local? As I think I mentioned earlier, that you know you do have this use of underscore three where it's copied to underscore twenty three. But I'm guessing that for the problem that we're talking about, uh, the simple, the quote unquote simple focus on just the pattern of if we see a local that's um, copied, that, that's moved or copied, assigned from 
a projection out of another local attempt to just do the replacement of the left hand side local with the thing on the right hand side everywhere that we see that left hand side local occur okay so that's that's the uh that's the the, the the hope is that we might be able to want something like that now um what do these things look like well there are other example analyses in here some of them are probably more complicated than what i'm hoping to describe that i'm hoping we'll see here um but as an example this is a path that does uh, constant propagation it takes scalar values so things that are where on the right hand side is a scalar you know something that's like a number or whatnot and attempts to then find all the places that um the places that that scalar flows into and just replace it with those values themselves and so this is a um, more intensive analysis, I think, than what I'm hoping to do here, because it's actually going to do data flow analysis, where it's going to in determine that, again, a data flow analysis might be actually what we need in the long term for justifying the transformation I'm talking about. But again, I don't want to focus on that yet. I don't want to focus on the work involved in the analysis. I want to focus on the work that's involved in doing the transformation itself. So what I want to see here is an example of how um, the actual transformation is performed. So I'm guessing that when I see phrases like collect and patch, I'm wondering if that's the thing that we might think is the, the, the thing that happens. Um, in particular, we see that it's saying we're going to be inserting the self that assignments. Um, But this is still, I think, just capturing like the places where the transformation should happen. And that's not exactly what I want. Um, I want to know what it looks like to actually do the transformation itself. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. Let's see. So this says, ah, here there's the collect here. And then the visit, because the, the results, I see. The results thing is the part that passes in the visitor and accumulates. I'm guessing it, it, it takes the data flow results. It then passes in the visitor and essentially says, okay, do a traversal of the results and store any information about what the visitor is supposed to do in the visitor and then do the actual transformation of the visitor. Um, as in this visitor collect and patch is going to actually do the transformation of the body. And it'll do that um, in its visit body implementation, or rather in the, it, sorry, it, it won't do it in the visit body implementation. It'll do it, collect and patch implements mere visitor, which is this whole interface on its own. Um, so, or results visitor perhaps, well, let's see. No, it implements the mute visitor, the mere mute visitor. Um, and in particular, in case it's not clear from what I was just sort of like skimming over there, um, we create the collect and patch visitor here, passing in the analysis map. For some reason, uh, the new call isn't the thing that actually does the collection of the results, instead it has a separate call for that. Um, I don't know. I don't know this code that well in terms of why that's structured that way, but I can build, I can understand it. And then visit body is the thing that actually does a transformation. And the crucial thing to understand about that is there is no visit body I'm betting in this code. As in, there's a call to visit body, but there's no implementation of it. And the reason is that um, the mere visitor, the mute visitor here is a kind of mere visitor. Uh, this is like one of the tasks I did pretty early on in my Rust work is to implement this this framework, the visitor framework for Mir. Um, that's not true. It was, I did a visitor for something else. It was a different. It was a different piece of AST. Um, but the point is, is we, we didn't have Mir when I first joined. Um, the point is, this visitor implements a programming pattern where it does the traversal of the Mir and has methods that it dispatches on for every kind of thing. Um, so like locations, for example, or 
um, like visiting statements or visiting locals, like the declaration of a local or the use of a local is another kind of visitor method. So there's all these methods and each one of them if there's some kind of recursive traversal that it might want to do, then the default implementation does that traversal by calling a corresponding super method. So the super method, so there's a pattern here inside these visitor, inside the visitor routine where it calls the corresponding super method in the trait. So the trait for vi the, the, the visitor traits, there's two of them. Um, and they are very similar in structure. So there's a macro that generates them. Um, there's one called visitor and one called mute visitor. And they both are generated by this macro, which creates the, each of the two traits. But the, the pattern is that each sort of visitor, there's a pair of visitor methods for each kind of um, state you might want to visit. There's the visit method, which is the one that's intended to be overridden. And then there's the super method that actually implements the default traversal that you'd expect to do for that recursively, um, or the, the, for the structured data there. In particular, uh, the body of mirror, is this gonna work? Nope, LSP is not gonna figure that out on its own. Um, so, you know, as the example here, um, you're, and even though these are all trait methods, they're in the trait, as it says in this comment here, they're not meant to be overwritten. They're just there as conveniences um, to be available, to be called. This is a template and hook style system where um, uh, uh, Rust, unlike Java, Java is a language where when you have you have super classes and you have interfaces and you have these things where basically you can have a class that defines a bunch of default behaviors and you can have a subclass that extends it and overrides some of those methods. In particular, Java it exposes the ability to call your super classes definition of those methods. So a common pattern in Java is to have the visitor class that will traverse all of the um, structure of a given data type, and then your extensions of that class will override specific methods of the visitor class but they can always call up to the super classes methods to, to bring back the default traversal that's embedded in that super class. Rust doesn't have um, super classes of that form. And so we don't have the ability to say, oh, call my super classes implementation of this because we don't have super classes. Um, we, don't, we don't expose that. Instead, instead, if you want to get that pattern, you need to do something like what the visitor method here, the visitor trait is doing here of actually having separate methods corresponding to um, super dot xxx, in this case super body, which will do the traversal. And what does the traversal look like? Um, well, that's a good question. Super body is going to do um, see, even this is like written in the form of a macro, so it's a little tricky to, 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 to sort of <laughs> understand it just by skimming over it, but you can get an idea of it and that it's what it's doing is it's calling the visit methods for each of the pieces of substructure for this data type. So in the particular, particular case of, of um, mirror or body, there's the basic blocks that are part of the mirror. There's the phase, the pass count, the source, um, the source scopes, the gen potentially the generator the local decals. The crucial thing is what things in here represent substructure that the visitor has methods to handle. And so the very first item, the basic blocks, is an example of something where that is substructure within a body that you need, that you want the visitor to recursively traverse. And so that's why we see a call to visit basic block data here. Where was I? So yeah, so the basic block fields is here. And so the basic block data is this thing here that we we call visit basic block data for each one of the blocks in basic blocks and likewise um the source scopes that's substructure that we want to visit and so there's a call to visit each one of the source scopes and the return type is a piece of data that's stored somewhere in the body where is it stored i think i missed it
Oh, that's interesting. It's oh, it's implicitly part of the local decals. That's interesting. Um, see, I'd forgotten that. I had forgotten that that was something special about this. That's interesting. So we end up, we treat that subject from the other local decals. We probably do. I'm guessing. I'm guessing, though I'm not sure that um, that local decal indices, you know, local decal indices may or may not include. Well, I could believe that. Oh, no, I just don't know off the top of my head. It's possible that we visit the return tie as a type on its own, and then we also visit all the local decals, and we might visit um, the return type conceptually twice in that process. But we do pass in the, the context when we call visit tie here, and I'm guessing that when we call it for visit local decal, um, so I'm assuming that soup the visit local decal will also visit the type and it passes in its context, but in this case it uses the local decal context. So that's a way you can sort of distinguish in the visit tie calls. If if I'm right in assuming that this actually ends up visiting the return type twice, it'll visit it, I assume, once passing in the context of the return type call. And then again, passing the context of the local decal call, I'm assuming. Okay, this is just to give you a sort of taste of what the visitor structure is like. The real point is that that transformation that we were looking at a moment ago, the collect and pack transformation, the way it's implemented then is there's a visit body call here. And conceptually what that ends up doing is since there's no implementation of visit body in the data flow constant prop file, that will end up then um, being automatically filled in as a call to super body by the visitor trait. And what does the super body do? We were just going over that. What super body does is it just recursively calls the visitor um, on each of these pieces of substructure of the body. And that will recursively do the same thing of recurring all the way down the visitor, uh, all the way down the body and all the pieces of such substructure within it, pass them on the visitor until you get to methods that the visitor actually overwrites um, and implements locally. And what are the methods that this visitor implements locally? They are visit statement and visit operand. And what does it do? It, when it sees an assignment, it just replaces the R value in the assignment with this one. And when it sees an operand, it replaces the operand with one it creates here. So that sounds really simple. I think in terms of this is like a pretty easy thing to do um, if you know what the transformation that you want actually is. So what we want to do is something similar where we want to have a dash Z flag that just tells it, hey, if you see a pattern of the form, I mean, I, I, I'm talking about something as as um, simple minded slash, uh, you know, slash wrong or however you want to phrase it. Um, something as trivial and not the right answer for the long term as hard coding in this local and hard coding in this local this projection and just saying if you see this pattern um then of a local and this up bar then do the replacement of the local with the up bar and do it for all of the occurrences of that local um, in the code. That's what I'm talking about. So that should be a transformation we can implement pretty easily. And then just have a Z flag that turns it on and seeing what effect it has. My guess is it may break things, but um, I want to give it a shot. Okay. So that was sort of a review of um, uh, how trans how mere transformations work in the, in the abstract and of the visitor um, routines that implement the, the guts of traversing a piece of mirror and then the hooks like the, the hooks within the visitor, like visit statement and visit operand here. It's important to note that a reason that these hooks are able to be done at all is because this is a mute visitor, so that it takes the, um, the mere by mutable reference. The reason that we saw this distinction between mute visitor and visitor here is that there's two variants of visitors. There's the one that takes a mutable reference to the mirror and can actually dynamically update it, change it. 
That's what the mute visitor does. And then there's the visitor that can't do that. Um, so we sort of build into the interface of the visitors whether it's allowed to mutate the structure of the mirror that it's visiting or not. And we get that static assurance um, up front in terms of our understanding of what these things are doing. Okay, so I'm gonna pause here for a moment and um, see where things are going. Okay, so, so far we sort of reviewed the way that a mirror transformation is implemented by using the visitor trait that mirror provides, uh, the mute, basically the mute visitor trait. And now I wanna actually try to dig in and add a new transformation, the one I've been talking about. Uh, so that, that'll attempt to handle this particular um, up far and to lo and local propagation. So let's let's actually call it that. Let's let's say um, I will create a file and I will, I will literally call it up far to local propagation. Um, and you know it might well be the case that well we'll see. I, I'm definitely anticipating the possibility that the code that I'll be writing in here has already been written or it could be handled by some other code that's elsewhere in this in this this code base because there's just, there's a number of mirror transformations that are only turned on at certain optimization levels and they aren't on by default because they aren't sound. And that's the whole problem here. I want to add something soon that I am relatively sure will be um, sound. So I'm willing to, I'm gonna make it a separate transformation that I can directly experiment with on its own without worrying about the soundness of other transformations. But I wanna, uh, I wanna pick a small transformation to use as a reference point um, because I want to figure out how to add my new transformation as easily as possible. Um, so let's see, this looks like it's probably a very small transformation, right? This is like a literally like, 30 line file, okay? So um, this pass propagates up bars to locals if it can determine um, a bit of a generator, I should say. Um, Coalescing is sound, okay? And <laughs> just as a reminder, <laughs> um, right, we're not focusing on the actual analysis yet to, to um, justify the transformation. We're just gonna hard code the transformation and try to prove that it does the job. So, um, this is going to be obstruct um, This is an interesting question about whether this thing is going to use a mirror op level or not as part of its um, work in the end. Um, let's let's come this out and just say true. Um, um, okay. And so if you remember, like this is going to be, there's different ways to handle this. Like we could just not use a visitor at all. We could do a direct um, walk over the body and just seek the patterns of the things that we're looking for. Um, Maybe that's the simplest thing to do right now rather than trying to use the visitor system. Um, I would be fine with that, I think. Oh, right, I've been, I've been doing some cut and paste coding here. Okay. Because um, if you remember, 
I was giving the example earlier of cons. I think it was cons propagation. I think it wasn't. Um, yeah, it wasn't. It was something else that had. It was some other propagation. Um, data flow cons propagation. Right. That was what I was looking at. But there's there's still a whole bunch of things that are doing various kinds of propagation of state. Um, but they do tend to use visitors. So it's possible that the right thing to do here would be to um, use the visitor pattern ourselves. But uh, I I don't know. Let's let's see. Well, hmm. okay. You know what? Let's do it the right way. Let's 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 make a visitor because like the whole thing is that uh, the reason why I'm struggling here is because when I saw this code in, in storage markers, I'm sitting here saying, well, oh, so here's the reason to use the visitor. So this code it really is oriented around statements. It's something where it's just looking for a certain kind of statement and killing them off, and that's a very blunt analysis, and it doesn't need to do anything too sophisticated. You know that these state you know that statements only occur in a certain place in the mirror. Like structurally, we can be uh, pretty sure. I mean, if, if we ever change the mirror such that it didn't obey that 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 rule, we would have to do a lot more analysis of things to like double check that things are are okay. But the point I'm making is that the only place structurally that mirror that statements which are these things, a statement has source info and then the enum that represents what kind of statement it is, um, which is somewhere here. You know what, I should use LSP for this. Okay, there it is, statement kind. So there's different kinds of statements. There's assignment statements, there's fake reads, there's set discriminant, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of statements that Mir has, but the crucial point is that um, a statement structurally within Mir I believe only occurs within bodies. If that invariant were ever broken, then for example, it's quite possible that the um, this this pass that I was just looking at a moment ago to remove storage markers, if you could ever have a statement that didn't just occur as solely, if there was ever a statement that occurs somewhere other than the statements vector inside of the basic, a basic block within the body, then this code would be broken. We'd have to update that. So if we are only trying to focus on doing sort of raw replacement of statements um, in a very sort of shallow manner, then this approach would make sense. However, however, this is where you need to be careful. Um, the, our goal here is not to just um, sort of do a blanket uh, inspection of um, some statements. Hmm. I don't know where the code is that I was looking at a moment ago. I was looking at those examples in the mirror dump, here we are. Um, so I, I just wanna point out, there's all kinds of statements we're gonna be looking at. And in particular, we're gonna be looking for all occurrences of a local and those local, and I'm not sure that this, this, this occurrence of this local might occur somewhere within some other piece of structure. Um, for example, it might occur within a place deeply within a statement, right? So uh, like this underscore one is a local and you could imagine the underscore three somewhere else could occur within a, a similar kind of place, a similar kind of context that's not just sort of shallowly at the surface level of statement, it's, it's embedded in a richer structure of a place here. It's a place that's a projection pushing out the, the dot zero um, from the local. So that's an argument for structuring our analysis as a, um, not via a trivial traversal, direct traversal of the mere body, but rather to actually make use of the visitor structure that I was showing a moment ago. So, okay, what does that look like then? And the answer is, uh, as I sort of alluded to earlier, we're not going to try to implement a sophisticated um, analysis yet, and we're not going to try to handle a bunch of cases yet. We're just going to hard code the case that we know we care about and see if we can like get the transformation to apply to it. So given that, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make, um, I'm gonna make up bar to local prop itself a mute visitor for Um, so this might require adding some more imports, 
because I don't think I imported that before. Uh, yeah, we still, because it's, it's part of the visit module inside of Mir. We could, we could sidestep that if we wanted to by um, using visit colon colon down below. It, it's really fine. Mute visitors is such a common thing, but I'm, I'm happy having this, this, this done this way. Okay. And I think the way that the mute visitor is defined, we don't need to define any methods yet. Obviously, we will need to eventually, but let's let's just leave this like this right now. Um, so the pass, when it runs, the way it's going to need to work is it's going to have to uh, actually call the, the, the visit method on the body. So we're going to, and in our case, the visitor, oh, right. There is a detail. Okay, so up bar to local prop itself. Oh, actually, will this work? So there's a detail here. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll think out loud. So the thing I was just wondering about, I'm making up bar to local prop a mirror pass. And that means it takes, the signature for that is it has run pass and it takes under uh, ampersand self, a shared reference to self there. And the thing I was just musing about is, well, the visit body method here, that's what we're going to want to call on something, right? There's going to be some visitor and we're going to call visit body on that visitor. And it's going to do the transformation we're talking about. And the thing I was musing to myself was, well, could we just have self be the, the visitor? Could we do that? And the reason that I don't think that's going to work is because I'm pretty sure that visit body takes self mutably. Like it take it wants the visitor that's passed in here to be a mutable reference. That's why it's, it's a declare the mute declaration there. And so we can't, and here run pass takes in a shared self. So and that's fine, that's fine. The reality here is that we wouldn't actually want the visitor to be the same thing as the structure that represents this propagation pass. Um, it just means that we have to do something like create our own um, up far to local prop visitor structure. Okay, we'll create the visitor. It needs to be, a unit, it needs to be immediately declared. Um, then we'll call visit body, and that will eventually implement the um, actual visiting of the visitor. Okay. Now, I obviously haven't done anything yet, right? I haven't actually, oh no, oh, I forgot to keep stage one, shoot. Oh, but luckily nothing changed, so it was very fast. <laughs> um, okay, let's let's fix that though. Um, I'm actually surprised that was so fast. That shouldn't have been that fast because I did make changes. Oh, this it doesn't know about this file though. Okay, yeah, right. The whole point of what I was gonna demonstrate is that I made these changes and obviously I haven't made any real changes yet, right? I haven't actually implemented a visitor. I haven't done anything that mutates the mirror yet. All that stuff's undone. But I wanted to actually demonstrate um, whether this code is being invoked at all by the compiler. And particularly there's this trace output here. I want to just demonstrate, hey, is this trace out observable? And yet, as you can probably guess, the fact that the build happened so fast, um, it, it, there's no way this trace output's going to be observable. Uh, and in particular, if I take the compiler I just built, uh, which is inside of obster. Uh, stage one in Rasi. If I call that on the file that I just create, I, that I created a little while ago, um, and then I say Rasi log equals Rasi mirror transform up far to local prop, we don't see any output. And you would hope we'd see some output here. And you might say, oh, do you have to do like equals trace here or something like that to like get it to output? I don't think you do, first of all. I don't think we need to say that. Um, but more importantly, it didn't, it didn't matter. It didn't help. So what's wrong? What haven't I done yet? And the answer, the obvious answer, what I haven't done yet, I created this file, but it's not used anywhere in the system. Rust is not, um, Rust as a language does not just magically try to guess the module structure of your code based on what files are there in the file system. There's been proposals to add that to the language, but it's not there today. And so we have to actually add this code to the um, modules that we have. Okay. 
And this is something that we can do. We can just add it um, down here. Um, okay, and let's see what happens now when we say compile. Okay, something's wrong. And what's wrong? Um, well, we didn't implement the TCX method. Okay, so I said before we don't need to implement any methods, but in fact, that was not true. Um, if we, if a mute visitor implements the TCX, the, all mere visitors have to actually carry a type context. Um, and so, and what they usually do is they just build it in as a field that they carry. So, okay, but that's another, that's another very good reason why we couldn't have made the, um, well, that's not true. I was about to say that's another good reason why we couldn't have had upvar to local prop in the visitor, but the upvar to local prop could hypothetically carry around a TCX itself. It just doesn't need to because we get one as part of the, the run pass here. So point is, okay, we'll add a TCX field, field to the visitor, which means we'll probably add, we'll need to actually extend um, it with a lifetime there, which means that we'll have to add that lifetime here. The usual stuff you see in Rust, it's kind of painful and you know everyone rightfully complains about. Okay. Okay, but now there's another, there's another quick lifetime here. And now I don't have enough of name visit body. That's interesting. Um, I had thought that I would get that from having it implement the mutable visitor. Hmm. Up far to local prop. Oh, oh, I'm still calling self here. Okay. Unused variable sess. That's, that's a little bit more interesting. Not really. We will, we may want that though. There's actually a Z flag. So I was talking earlier about having this be handled by a Z, a Z flag. Um, so we probably will actually, instead of having this be controlled by the mirror op level, we'll want to inspect this, the Z flags um, on the debug session, on, on the session, in order to determine whether to run this or not. Uh, that will be something we change um, before we make any serious movement with this. Because right now, this transformation is going to run unconditionally, including as part of the bootstrap process. Now, I'm using keep stage one, so it's actually not going to rebuild the standard library. Uh, it will reuse the previous one. So if there were bugs in this code, they would not propagate into the standard library that gets built because it's not rebuilding the standard library. But we have to do something about that uh, until we are sure this analysis is correct. Um, or at least, or conservative enough to be applied to standard library, we need to be very careful where it runs. Um, we don't want to get ourselves in a situation where our bootstrap code it can't even um, compile simple examples anymore. That's what this thing you'd want to avoid. So one way to do that is to make heavy use of keep stage one. And, but another more important way to do it is to guard your code with um, uses of dash Z flags to ensure that it never runs the things. Okay, this ran this time, great. Let's find out now if this code is running. It still isn't running. It still isn't running. Why not now? So is it possible we didn't get our code right? Well, we know we updated, we know we did some work here. We know that it spent some time compi recompiling Rusty near transform. So I'm taking that as a hint that this code is being compiled, right? We, and we saw the fact that we're, it was trying to compile our code. It saw errors in it. So I think that is a strong hint that our code was compiled, but we haven't integrated it the right way yet. We still haven't figured out the right way to actually integrate it into the mere transformation system. And that's not surprising because all we did was add this up, this module declaration and Rust does not have um, any kind of automatic reflective capabilities to say, oh, once you add a module, like do some sort of digging to automatically extract initialization routines from that module. We do have static, that's not entirely true. Like we do have static, you can have static code blocks that get run as part of a module. So you can have action at a distance that way, but it's not um, typically the way people implement things. And so if you look at the library code here, in fact, what people do is they add the providers um, for the various passes, I believe. Um, and so I, uh, what I would recommend in the kind of situation like this, though, I'm very, 
like people there's a term called cargo cult coding and it's the idea of basically saying rather than try to figure out how every piece of the system works just see how someone else did it and copy them and you can make some pretty sal- valid criticisms of that approach and yet at some level like it's the way that's going to get us to something that's running the fastest um so we were using earlier i was trying to show looking at other simple examples like remove storage markers so what I would recommend, for example, is find out how something like remove storage markers is in- integrated into the system. It has a module declaration here, and then it has a use right here. And what is this use? It's part of this thing that does run passes. The run optimization passes uh, pass happens here. And uh, the crucial question is whether this is actually like the right place to put this in the long term. Like, for example, if this is a pass that we do, this this connects to something I tried to bring up earlier, um, whether this is going to be something that is connected to the mere op level or not. If it's something, if it's a transformation that we're going to run unconditionally, then you want to be really careful to not put in a place that actually runs conditionally. And I don't know this code, whether it is um, run unconditionally. I just don't know off the top of my head. Um, for example, the generator straight transform is run as part of the runtime lowering passes. And in fact, that's another really important detail and now that I think about it. This pass, we really want this pass to run before the generator transform happens. That's actually critical for it to work the way I want it to work. This transformation I'm talking about of replacing the locals with their upvars is, <laughs> if we don't run that before the generator transform, then it won't matter that we put it in at all because the, the, we have to have it run before the generator transform. Otherwise the generator transform will choose a layout that it, that includes space for the local in the generator structure. And that will then mean that we will not get the benefit of this transformation that we're hoping for. Okay. So that's an argument then that perhaps we should um, put the transformation somewhere else. We shouldn't make it in the same place that we had. Um, the, the, the heart of what I'm trying to point out here is just that there's passes like remove storage markers that are called as part of run optimization passes. And I am arguing that in fact, I'm going to do it somewhere else. Um, I'm going to do it here right before the generator state transform. Uh, and I'll say the comment. It's interesting. There's um, it's not consistent in this code whether to put back quotes around the uh, references to types or not. Okay, now having said that, let's run this, or rather compile this now. Um, let's see if we can get, uh, again, the whole point of what I'm doing right now is just trying to demonstrate how the mirror optimization is gonna be integrated to the rest of the compiler and demonstrate it actually running, um, as in the code that I put in doing something. And what is that something I'm referring to? I'm really solely talking about, um, Oh, that's a shame. It couldn't figure out what the, L- the LSP, LSP can't figure out to go there. Maybe it hasn't indexed that file yet. Um, I'm solely talking about this trace call. That's the code I'm talking about wanting to observe running. Um, and once we can see that happening, we'll be in really in business to start doing some um, interesting stuff here. Oh, I just realized something else I should have done. So I'm, my, my recompilers are happening a little bit more slower than they should because I'm blindly passing in. Um, I'm not passing in library here as an argument. And so it's rebuilding Rust stock and we're wasting time doing that. Uh, so in fact, I'm going to stop this passed in library 
stop the compilation process. It should go very fast because it's skipping the Rust doc build now. Okay, great. Okay, let's try this again. Oh, look, awesome. Okay, so now we've demonstrated integrating um, that transformation into the compiler. And it's not doing anything. It's truly not doing anything yet, except for printing out, oh, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running again, I'm running again, very exciting. Okay. Okay, so we left off at a pretty exciting note of like having demonstrated successfully integrating in a transformation, not a, a, a no-op transformation, but a transformation nonetheless, um, in the pipe into the pipeline and see observing its output, the output of the trace calls that we that are in, in as part of it. Okay, the next step before we do anything else, it's very important to do this soon before we forget, is to add a dash z flag that will control whether this transformation even runs at all. Because I do not want this transformation while it's in a under development state to have any risk of um, messing up the state of the compile. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go, if you remember before, we got this lint about the session um, being unused. And we're going to start using it because what we're going to do is we're going to add a debug flag that will um, uh, where are the debug options? Okay, so I can't remember which one of these declarations I need to go to to find the debug options. And so my solution when I encounter this kind of problem uh, is, is I mentioned before this this the, you know the, the the cargo cult approach to um, coding, and this is another instance of that where what I'm going to do is I'm going to see see an example of another debug flag. I'm going to find that's interesting. Why is my system so responding so slowly right now. Um, I'm going to pause for a second because I, this is not used. Oh, okay. That's okay, I guess. Hmm. All right. Um, yeah, it seems like it's responding now. Okay, so there's a bunch of Z flags. And the point is, I'm just going to grab one of them. The very last one, the WASI exec model. And just look where it's declared. Um, WASI underscore exec model. You have to sort of get... Searching for the dashes here will lead you astray because this thing is generated by a macro that maps underscores the dashes. Okay, but this is this is the crucial thing, um, and I'm going to now. There probably is a place where the mirror optimizations themselves are controlled, although I think it's more like coarse, like just unsound, all unsound mirror optimizations. Let's see if there's anything else about mirror optimizations though. There's the mirror op level. Um, and there is this mirror enable passes that can control specific passes. So arguably we could just leverage this um, mirror enable passes as the thing, but I don't feel like, I, I don't know. I, I just don't want to accidentally enable the thing. Um, I'm really scared of doing that. So I'm, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to, I'm going to use my own flag for the short term. Because the long term, anyways, this thing's going to be on by default. Uh, like, the whole point of this thing is that it's going to be on by default, even, I think, when optimizations are turned off. So, um, yeah, the only question is whether I would call this a mirror, whether I, like, what am I going to name this thing? The fact that it's a mirror optimization makes me want to actually prefix it with mirror in the name. Ugh. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. I'm worried that I have something wrong here because I keep seeing that the, I'm assuming it's just that my, my buffer is, yeah, okay. But I was worried that the, the, the colors were, were wrong, but it's just that my buffer was uh, not updating itself very fast. Okay, that's a dash Z flag that we're adding. And then we're going to make use of it 
um, in our of our local prop code to actually say, look, only do this. Um, how do I get this information? I don't remember how to actually observe this piece of state. Um, let's see, debug ops. Well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to guess. Oh, you know what? No, I'm going to try this. I'm going to see how much the compiler can help me. Like, I'm pretty sure that just saying this is not going to work. Um, but it will error. Let's recompile with this state. Now, unfortunately, the session is used um, by other parts of the system. Um, so every time you add a debug flag like this, it means you have to recompile a bunch of crates. And that's a little unfortunate. Um, maybe there's an argument for decoupling that. I don't know. There's a piece of the session that you would think you'd want to allow people to modify and rebuild a lot more aggressively. And debug flags are things that are inherently you would think are not like queried on hot paths. So there might be an argument for re-architecting the system to allow people to add and remove debug flags and rebuild more effectively, like more efficiently by, by using a different representation for them. Um, but that's not what we do today. Instead, you just have to pay the cost every time you add a debug flag of rebuild, doing a whole bunch of rebuilding that you wouldn't necessarily want to have to do. See, okay, this is what I was expecting to see. Um, that, yeah, and this is actually the reason not to that. The re a reason that, an example of a kind of system that I was imagining when I just said this like more decoupled system would be the one where the set of debug flags is handled by a, um, a hash table of strings that isn't embedded as known fields in the type. But the problem with that approach is that you wouldn't get nice compiler messages like this in that case. Um, and what is the crucial thing that's nice about this message? It suggested to us this new field. This is the thing I couldn't remember what to, what to use but the compiler helped us find it. Um, where we now will say unstable ops. Okay. And this should go more quickly. Oh, I have to spell it right though. So what is the outcome I'm hoping for here? The outcome I'm hoping for now is when I redo that experiment that I did a moment ago, uh, where I went and ran the compiler, my, my local build the compiler on our test case with this rusty log invocation. Now I don't want to see the trace output. I don't want to see the trace output unless I patch this, patch this new dash Z flag in. That's my goal now, because I want to make sure I'm precisely controlling when this optimization, this transformation fires. Because until I get the analysis right, that will control when the transformation happens, um, I want to make sure this transformation does not apply at all. So the steps here are first, um, add the debug flag that controls the transformation, and then, then two, implement the transformation. Three, validate the transformation actually has the effect I want on the generated object code in terms of the size of the futures. And then if that's all the case, then we'll be in a great position to implement the analysis that'll justify doing the transformation. So now when we pass the Z flag, we see the trace output. And if we don't pass the Z flag, we don't see the trace output. Awesome. Okay. So we're in a great position to now uh, go ahead and um, do whatever the next step I was describing was of actually implementing the transformation. Okay, so the transformation in question is um, that we want to look at the kind of example that I was talking about before, right? It just, <laughs> it'll just hard code in the fact that we're talking about local three and local one and dot zero and up at, at the up bar that is represented by local one projected to dot zero. So. All we're going to do in our little visitor here is whenever we see occurrences of a local three, we're going to replace it with underscore one dot zero. I think that's like the level of dumbness we're going to talk about here. Um, 
and then we'll see where that gets us. So how do we do that? Well, um, uh, I'm pretty sure that we have, if we looked at the, the data flow transformation from earlier, it had visit operand as one of the kind of um, things it could, it could be applied to. And then it would look at the operand itself. And what is an operand in mirror? An operand is either a copy of a place or a move of a place, or it's a pre-existing constant. So I'm now wondering, we could, we could do this to all operands. We could like do it as a transformation on visit operand. But I'm wondering, is there a visit place in mirror, in the mirror visitor? Um, because, or the mirror mute visitor? Is that, is that a sensible thing to do? Let's see. There is a visit place. And it has immutability. Like we could just say, let's visit place. The problem there might be if it recursively descends the place structure. If visit place actually recurses into um, a place, which I imagine it probably does do. Uh, no, that might be okay. That might be okay. That might be the right thing. I was sorry. I was just musing to myself about like the, so the issue here is that what we want to do is we want to find all occurrences of underscore three and replace it with underscore one dot zero. And this actually sounds like the perfect place to do that in that if there were a projection into underscore three, I think that replacing the, like doing operating on the place means that it'll go and update that inner place within it. Um, I'd be good to verify, validate that claim though. So visit place works by calling super place on the place. And what does super place do? Um, it first calls the local. Oh yeah, you don't have to recursively call because the structure of places is that it's just the local and then it's the series of projections uh, on that local. Um, which means that for our situation, we will need to be careful to, uh, if it is, if the local in question is underscore three, then we'll want to both replace it with underscore one and, but also update the projections as well. Um, so that's important to make sure we get the project, update the projections the right way to add the dot zero in the right, the right place of the place. In particular, um, the structure of a place in mirror, um, the way, what it looks like is a vector of place elements, right? There's the local itself. And then there's a vector of place element or, well, sorry. Oh, it's in fact a shared reference of place elements. We can't just modify. This isn't a vector you can push and pop onto. Um, you need to more care. You need to do something more clever here in terms of creating a new sequence. Um, that's a copy of the old one. And with the dot zero in the right spot. Um, I don't know how that's represented to be honest. Like I can't remember anymore whether this is this is presumably intern somewhere in the TCX. Um, or wait, this is a place ref. Is that the same as a place? A place is sorry, I was I was looking in the wrong spot before. A place is a local and then a reference to a list. And what's a list? A list is um, it's like a slice. Okay. All right. So this is the same issue holds that I was bringing up before, namely that, um, uh, namely that we can't just like modify this place as it stands, we have to replace it with a different place, I'm pretty sure that will, or at least replace the re projection. So now I'm wondering how is this handled elsewhere? Is this something we, we, it's quite possible we just don't, simply don't do this kind of transformation very frequently, um, where we uh, would, would modify a place in the way I'm describing. Um, yeah, I don't know. But let's let's go back to our uh, far as. But we well we do need to do this kind of transformation. That that's there is a place there is some place where the generator in particular 
is an example where I know we have to do this kind of transformation because we have to replace the local there with when the generator runs, when the generator transformation runs, it will replace all those locals with projections into the self structure to those fields that are created um, for the locals. So, in fact, we could look at the um, the way that this is implemented, where it's uh, going to update some kind of structure, and it's either going to do it by um, updating the um by visiting the places yeah see look at this yeah look we're gonna do a uh generate struct access we're gonna replace the base and we're gonna do a make field of it so um this is actually the, like the exact kind of transformation we're going to do something very very similar where we are going to take the place that we get and plug in our new the new other local, the upvar itself. And then we're also going to, um, but, and we're also going to use a new, uh, here it's a place that references a generate struct field. We will make a, a place that references the, the zero, the, the, the zero two, the, the tuple element zero of the upvar, or that represents the upvar on underscore one. Okay. I am now looking at this wondering, I'm assuming that underscore one is the self arg. Um, yeah. Okay. So this like is going to look very similar to what we're going to do, except instead of doing this business about projecting down to a variant, certain variant index, we're just going to grab out the projection to the first tuple um, of the thing, the zero, the zero tuple element. Okay. But this is great. This seems like, uh, a good model for us to get to make some progress with. So yeah, look at this, like this looks exactly like the kind of thing we'll actually want. Because here, they do a replace base, and they are replacing place. Here, they're replacing the self. They're looking at the self and saying, if it's the self arg, then we're going to replace it. So it's not quite the same thing, because they are doing something where they're looking at every occurrence of a place and saying, if this thing is the self arc underscore one, then in fact, we're going to take it and replace it with a different a projection on the self arc. So it's not quite the same as what we're doing, but it's pretty close because we will similarly, similarly be doing a projection of field zero on the self arc. And the only issue that I can imagine is, is whether we'll be able to easily get access to a tie to pass in as part of that projection. Let's see where we can go with this. So Now, if we remember, the, 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 because we're doing a simple minor transformation here, um, we are literally just looking for a place that has the local of three. Um, how do we observe that? Um, How do we observe the index of a local? Because we're just gonna be doing bad things here and looking at the index directly. Um, it's a new type index, which, no, that's not what I want. Um, oh, I think you just asked for, ask it for it. You say index on it. We might have to, I don't know if we want to call it. Well, okay, let's just say that. Let's say if the place local index is three, and the place um, if we're looking at a place and we have no no, we don't need to worry about the projections, we just need to extend the projections. That's right. If the place local is three,
then we want to um I'm curious, I'm trying to remember now whether replace base is going to Yeah, it can do this thing where it depends on the projection. Okay. Interesting. Is this right? Let's see. New projection, take the old projection, turn it into a vector, and then take the place. Yeah, so the new place is going to have its own projection, and we're going to take that and then append onto it the old place's projection. Because the concept here is the old place had a series of projections added onto it. And the new place that's going to be that the new base is itself going to have its own set of projections. You want to preserve that initial prefix as a prefix that new base's series of projections, and then append onto it the old place's projections that it was using. So this actually is some helper routine that um, <laughs> I am tempted to like either cut and paste right now or move into some utility code because this seems like a kind of thing that you could imagine being useful in more places. I think what I will do is put it right now into li the library code um, because it seems useful to me to do that. Uh, okay, um, and then with that, in that there, then we can say, look, replace base of place with, now what do we want to do it on? We want to take something that is the self arg but we want to do a projection on it. We want to get the zeroth element of it. Um, which we can do, how, what are the best ways to do this? I had thought there were helper routines to actually get do simple projections off of um, vectors. And I'm wondering if they're off of, sorry, projections off of places. So I'm just sort of wondering whether it's worth exploring that. Um, No, maybe not. It doesn't seem like this is, this seems like the kind of, this, this is the kind of thing that I was thinking of anyway. Um, so replace base, place, self arc, projection, self dot TCX in turn place LMs, projection LM field. But again, I'm sitting here wondering, is this something that's worth copying into its own um, code? No, not for my purposes, because unlike unlike replace base, which really is general purpose, and I can imagine using in the future, this is very special case to like these particular fields. It might be that I do end up. Cr the only thing I can imagine doing is making a up var um, utility function that you know can take in something like zero and does all of this stuff. Um, but I'm not I'm not there yet in terms of being convinced that it's worth. Um, now the other question though is what is the type we can use here? Now the whole justification for doing this is that the types will be the same, uh, but the type here. Um, I don't know if I have ready access to the type I need to feed in here. Let's see. The place, because I'm, I'm wondering if I have to manipulate, the place that I'm replacing. Hmm. 
maybe this is the wrong approach though. Maybe this, this helper is in fact not the right thing. Because I'm trying to construct a whole place of whole, whole, whole cloth for this. And um, it just, that requires constructing this place to be fed in there. And that will require have constructing this, knowing what the type is to use for that place. But the new base that I'm creating is gonna get thrown away immediately. Like I'm going through this work to create something that's like this well-typed thing and trying to figure out what type to plug in here when it's not relevant because this helper doesn't need that type. This helper is just going to pull out the projection and build up this other thing anyway. So maybe this utility code doesn't have as much utility as I was hoping for. Um, okay. Well, I'll put it back later. Um, let me go ahead and just take what's here now and think about what to do. Uh, so, sorry, so th there was a type here is the point. Um, right, that was what's gonna happen in terms of ref gen time, right, there's some tie there. In this case, it's the generator reference type, but that's not what I care about for what I'm doing. Um, okay, and this, and this, and this, come there, that goes there. Um, so, Hypothetically, this is what the code we'd want to run when the index is three um, and for our hard-coded transformation, except that I don't want to deal with figuring out how to make replace space work. So instead, I'm going to say, okay, what is the actual code for replace space? Because I don't want to figure out the expected type there. Instead, I will say, okay, replace space, the way it works is it takes in place, it takes a new base, which I'll name explicitly now. take the TCX, okay? And then what it's gonna do is assign a new base, create a new projection, and assign and put that projection into the place where we want it to go, and we'll be done with that. Okay, which means that place slot local is now self arg, and the projection that we're trying to transform here. Um, wait, did I mistake? Did I mistake this? The projection element still needs the expected tie. It's not even something I can. I can't get. I can't get away from this by removing the use of replace base. I still need to create the projection element with the right expected type there. Okay. Um, Okay, that's not the end of the world because that means that each projection element actually has the type attached that I want. So if this transformation is valid, I should be able to get the type I need uh, as the type of the local, right? The type of three of index of the place index three is the expected type that I need here. So um, is there a way I can get the type associated with a local like that? Um, in terms of what the, the mirror decals hold? I don't know. Um, it's possible it has a type. It's possible it doesn't. A local decal carries a type. Awesome. So if I just find the local decal for this type, I can use that as the expected projection for uh, our 
the field that we're pulling out of the um out of the the the, the, the self arc down here. So let's let's find that type then. So um So the body carries the local decals. Um, and that might be enough on its own. All we have to do then is figure out how to do the lookup on the body. The self for this visitor doesn't have the body yet, but it could. Um, I think it could carry. Well, no, because we're, tra we're traversing the body. We can't carry a shared reference to the body itself um we can oh that's gonna be a pain then huh like we want to get access to this local decal information here but we don't want to do it um in a manner that causes us to have to take a shared reference to the body um Okay, the simplest thing to do then is for us to extract the types we need before we run the pass. So in our case here, um, what we'll do is our visitor will have to pull out the types for the locals that we're doing the replacement on and then use that information as we're going. Um, and I'm just sort of wondering, is there a, it might overcomplicate this problem. Is there a simpler thing we could do to get this information? But I don't think so. Like, like as an example, um, if the place itself has a way to say, look, I've got an empty projection, tell me what its type is, that might be part of the implement, what's implemented for place. I just can't remember off the top of my head. Like there is a reason that we have these types attached to the projections. And you would think that, but I think I think the extraction of that type does require, in the general case, access mutable uh, shared access to the body for the mirror. So I don't think that we're going to be able to do it locally here. Um, so okay, then I will I will go ahead and start thinking about this. Of um, I think the simplest thing to do again, we're still focusing on hard coding every answer to our questions. So. Uh, I will just literally encode a local tie here. Um, and it won't always be present because, well, if this runs, it has to be present. So it's more like if there's a local that we can use this on, then we will pull it out and um, use it. And if there isn't, we will not run the, we will not even create the visitor at all. Um, so the process now is given the body. look at the local decals um, and get out the one at index three. How do we construct locals? New. Okay, um, we first, this is not something we can do in general because we don't know if it's that long. Um, but if we do it, if we manage to get out that local decal, then uh, we can say, okay, give me the type of it.
right? The type's sitting right there. So we can say local decal three chi as the answer for what this thing's bound to. And if we can't get it out, if this get returns none, then we'll just return without writing anything. So stay for very long because it's right it won't be part of the permanent code it's only what it's only here for a while we're doing this hard coded reference to three in our code here okay and then we have a type for local three we pass into our visitor here and then we can use that as our type here and with that in place i think we can go back to what we were saying earlier about calling replace base Place and new base and TCX. It would be amazing if it compiles. No, of course not. Um, but that's an easy one to fix. Do we need here? What kind of tie does everyone else use? I mean, it's not here. I know that. I'm just curious what import they use. Rusty middle tie. That's what I thought. Oh, in fact, it's sitting right there. I wonder what. I'm assuming it's just support at the library level. Okay. Um, can't find place context, sure. All right, there's a whole bunch of uh, imports like that that I'm expecting we'll have to uh, add. But luckily our compiler is very helpful. It tells us about them. Index. Um, hopefully that's right. Self arg unfound. Oh, that's only part of generator. Of course, it's only part of generator. Um, yeah, this seems like something that I would not move up. It's it's very specific to generator transformation, and so up part of local prop is as well. But I, I, the replace base transformation is one that I do see having like a general kind of general flavor to it. But this treatment of self of, of self arg is, is not that it's not sufficiently general for me to move it up. Um, and besides, this thing well maybe it's always going to stay as self arg. I don't know what's going to happen there because it is part of sort of a far treatment. Um, okay, we don't use the context to place context yet. Sure, we don't use the location at all. Sure. I didn't actually print out the uh, <laughs> like a description of what the transformation did. I, I, it's usually a good practice to, rather than printing out that a transmission, transmission didn't occur, to actually print out that it did occur and what the transmission like looks like when it did occur. I mean, I, I print out that I'm skipping it and why I'm skipping it. But then here, arguably, it may be good to say, oh, I'm replacing this place with this other place when I do this transformation here. But I didn't, I didn't, I didn't include that. And let's see what happens now. Okay, no Z flag. So it didn't do anything. Um, interesting, did it? Does it accept both the underscore form? It must accept the underscore form and the dash form. I didn't even consider that. I've always just used the dash form. Okay. 
this is something. We got an ice. That's pretty cool. So this is good in the sense that like something went wrong. Um, and the compiler told us that we did something that it did not expect. And what went wrong here is the question. Um, it's saying that there is an index out of bound from layout. I wonder if this is something about the fact that I, it's expecting there to be. Okay, so I don't, I don't know the answer is yet. This is gonna take some investigation. Um, it's expecting there to be a type here and there is no type, that's a problem. Um, and where is this from? It's from a tuple. Of length zero. All right, that's interesting. Is we gonna get any? I don't want to try to de debug all of this, but there's lots of reports of things that are problematic, like out of bounds field zero here. Okay, this is a sign that maybe my transformation is not well formed yet. Um, certainly possible. It might be the case that my transformation is off, was, is operating too frequently. Let's, I'm tempted to do, so, okay, there's obviously the ice that we see, but before we investigate that ice, I want to see if I can see some lump dump mirror output. It's possible we won't get any or it's possible to see some. Um, and in particular, are we gonna see, we do see up our local crop before and after. We can actually look at what our transformation did, which is pretty awesome. And the answer is, um, oh, this is a constant, we want the closure. And maybe we won't get it for the closure, or maybe we will, or that's a different closure. Up for the local prop, up for the local prop. Here we are. Before, after. Let's put before on the bottom and after on the top. Before on the top and after on the bottom. And what do we see? Like in particular, the thing I want to know is what happened to under, is underscore three still in the code? It's not, look, or there is storage live for it. We might have to get rid of that. Um, but look at this. This is the kind of thing that I was hoping to see. This is silly, of course. We want to get rid of this assignment. Like this is a dead, this should be trivialized um, and, and removed. But underscore three only appears as storage live and storage dead, and that's it. Now, what, now, if you remember, before we saw, I think it was underscore 23, was the um, array that was used. And if we look for it, we see it's been replaced with an assignment from the up bar. Fantastic. Now, if the code wasn't, so if the compiler wasn't icing, we might even be able to validate uh, that this had the transformation effect that we wanted. It's possible it doesn't, though. This underscore 3 is still being reported as something that's um, storage live and storage dead probably across an await. Probably, it's probably still being allocated. I don't know that for sure. And so we might have to, the point is we might have more work to like actually get rid of these storage lives and storage deads, but we can get to that. First, I wanna attack this ice. And before then I wanna pause because this is really great progress in some ways. Like it's not the correct, now there's nothing, there will come kind of analysis yet, but we've seen an actual transformation on the mirror based on some hard coded, um, assumptions about the transmission that we want to do and we've had a very real effect on the mirror that we generate and that's awesome all right